Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, mostly just answering a bunch of viewer mail. So, mostly questions about knife making today, uh, but a couple things that I wanted to mention before we get started. Um, first, I'm gonna be doing several um, videos about lasers in the upcoming uh, months. I recently got, uh, actually I've got it, gotten my hands on a couple of different lasers. I mean, I'm really just blown away with what you can do with these things. They're called laser engravers. You know, it used to be that they were fa fairly low powered. And so mostly what they did is they sort of burned little designs in wood. Uh, but as they've gotten more powerful, you can get 20 watt uh, diode lasers now pretty, pretty easily you know, for a pretty reasonable price, I guess I should say. And, <laughs> I mean, they can cut to close, close to an inch thick piece of wood now. They also can do a lot of cool engraving, do logos on your blades and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, if you're interested in just kind of expanding the range of knife making, maybe you're, you know, a little bit bored with what you're doing right now and you just want something new, uh, or, and this is the reason that I was intrigued by them originally. If you just want to put logos on your blades, you know, it used to be that all of my blades, either you do a touch mark over at the forge, you know, which is basically one mark that represents everything you do for years, um, or you have a stencil of some sort uh, and use electrolysis to do a logo on your blades. I don't really like either of those approaches. I mean, the touch mark is a very traditional thing for forging, which is great. And so, you know, whatever, fine. Um, and then if you do stainless steel, more production kind of oriented stuff, the best uh, alternative I would say for, for doing logos is to have these little stencils and then you etch your, um, your logo into the blade. You have to produce those things photographically. The best way to do it is to actually, you know, ship them out and have somebody else do them for you. What that means is you're kind of stuck with this one thing. And if you want to change your logo or update it or put a different, you know, mark on particular different kinds of blades, maybe a model, you know, each model, any of that is a real hassle. And Frankly, I just always dreaded putting the logos on my, uh, on my blades. It's just a hassle. The laser, way easier uh, and so, so, so much more versatile. Anyway, keep your eye out, uh, you know, over the course of the next couple months. I, I'm going to be trying to, you know, do just a whole bunch of different things, experiment with a, a little bit and, you know, see how they might be useful for you guys as well as for me. So one other quick item. Um, somewhat at my sister's behest, uh, my sister is kind of my business manager, she suggested that uh, I do a PDF of sort of just some basic tips for how to get started in knife making. Um, and uh, so I've got that available in the cards and descriptions. You know, I've, I've been an artist of one sort or another for a long, long time, basically all my life. And I'm always getting questions from people, even before I was a knife maker, back when my job was writing, I'd get a, a lot of people who just, there was, there was some psychological hurdle that they had to overcome to start doing new stuff. Um, especially something that seems like it's kind of a big, complicated project. And uh, most things, it's just a matter of kind of putting one, one foot in front of the other and that's kind of what this PDF is designed to help you do, is just get started in that one foot in front of the other sort of process. Okay, starting in with the viewer questions. Uh, this is from Lee Myring. Uh, hi, Walter. I enjoy learning the craft of knife making, some other preliminary stuff. Um, I've progressed from old files to 1095 and am currently using ADCRV2. Very happy with that, but he's interested in moving into stainless steel. Um, seems like the quench process can be done with plates and liquid nitrogen. He's got liquid nitrogen available. Just thoughts 
and recommendations on the type of stainless steel to use. So this really int introduces kind of a whole panoply of stuff. Obviously, I'm, I'm going to address the question of what kind of steel that you ought to use. Um, but it's just important, I think, for a lot of guys who are fairly early on in the craft of knife making to understand that there's a big, big difference between how you make knives with stainless steel and how you make it with carbon steel. Now, typically, I mean, this is not, you know, an absolute, but typically people who are forging are going to be using high carbon steel and people who are uh, doing stock removal will tend to use stainless steel. Probably the main reason that this is the case is that heat treating stainless steel is a whole different ball game from heat treating high carbon steel. High carbon steel is pretty forgiving, meaning that the amount of time that you heat it and the temperature band that you heat that steel to, it's not super crucial. I mean, you'll hear people saying, oh, if you get it over this temperature and under, you know, and, and to some degree that's true um, with the kind of steels that you would typically forge with, but not always. Um, and not sometimes to the degree that people would lead you to believe. Stainless steel, on the other hand, it is true. Um, the more alloying elements that you add to a steel, the more metallurgical complexity that there is to the steel. So what are the implications of that? The first implication is you know, just a mechanical thing. You have to be able to control your temperature very, very accurately if you're going to get even a reasonable amount out of the stainless steel that you're using. So what that adds up to is one of those, a uh, heat treating oven. They're not super expensive, but you know, they're not cheap either. And when you're, you know, getting started, you're looking at probably a belt grinder. If you're forging, you've got a forge and an anvil and the hammers and tongs and all that. So it starts to add up after a while. So uh, a lot of people just will start out, you know, on the high carbon steel side and then sort of migrate over to stainless steel later on. If you're going to do that, obviously, first, you know, job one, you got to have some kind of heat treating oven that can very accurately take you up to 1900 degrees or whatever. Okay, so that's all preliminary to the question of exactly what steel is the right steel for you to use. The answer is there is no right answer. So in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, there have been just this blizzard of new steels that have come along. Uh, particle metallurgy has, has really blossomed. Um, and we've got all these really cool steels that have been, uh, how would I put it? I, I guess the main thing is that they're, they're a little bit more niche oriented than some of the older steels. The oldest knife making steels like 440C, I'm talking stainless steel, 440C, CPM 154, ATS 34, uh, some of those kind of steels that were real popular, you know, when I got started, um, they weren't really invented as cutlery steels necessarily. Now, there's been this constant kind of jockeying to get the latest, greatest steel and all this, and they tend to be aimed at ever more niche sort of uses. Basically, you've got edge holding, hardness, um, shock resistance, corrosion resistance. You know, there, there are a whole bunch of different things that you might want to have out of a knife. And it's not like just, oh, I can make this steel harder, and that's great, and that's all we need. To a degree, at least, when you get things harder, they're also more brittle. And, you know, so you're always playing these things off against each other. And so uh, a lot of these kind of new super steels, you know, have some significant disadvantages as well as some significant advantages. I mean, just as a, for instance, some of the high vanadium steels 
are a real bear to, um, to grind. Uh, you know, and, and that's just one really small example. So where am I leading with this? One of, the, one of the things that happens now is especially because of the internet is that every time a new steel comes out, all these people go running off, oh, I gotta, I gotta use this, this you know, magna cut, CPM, whatever. You know, the, all these deals are supposed to change your life. The reality is that for most applications, you know, cutting vegetables, cutting string, cutting paper, they're not, they're not all that different, <laughs> frankly. And so um, the most important thing I would always say is just find something that seems a little bit in the middle. Don't try the hardest thing. Don't try, you know, the, the thing with the most edge retention or the most corrosion resistance. Get something kind of in the middle. And, you know, some of those good old steels like ATS-34 or 440C are honestly perfectly good steels. Um, and among some of the newer steels, S30V is, a, is kind of a, you know, middle-of-the-road steel that kind of does a lot of things decently. And, and I would tend to say, for your first knives, those are the kind of steels that you ought to concentrate on. More to the point, I highly recommend people not just chasing after endless numbers of steels. It's good to just say, okay, here's something I'm gonna take and learn. I, I'm not gonna do this and then do that and then do that and then do the other thing and really never learn how to get the most out of a particular steel. What I would really counsel this gentleman who asked th this question to me is, Honestly, it doesn't matter that much. Find something kind of middle of the road that seems, you know, that people seem to think is pretty decent. And, you know, S30, S30B, um, ATS34, 440C, and there are plenty of others. Those are just ones off kind of off the top of my head. They're all fine. And use it for a while and make sure that you're making good knives with that basic kind of steel before you go out spending a whole bunch of money on really fancy steels that may actually have a, a very niche kind of use for you. Second question here is, uh, do I teach any uh, in-person classes? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I, get, I get asked this a lot. Um, you know, I've moved to a new shop. I'm, part of the reason that I wanted to move here is I wanted to be able to give classes with multiple students. If you just come and do a one-on-one -on -one class with me, it's not cheap. That's just the reality, you know, getting me and my shop and a whole bunch of tools and propane and, you know, all this stuff, it's just going to cost you a few bucks. That's just the reality of it. So later this year, I do want to be starting to do, you know, multi-person classes, um, but there's kind of some organization and some back end to that that I haven't really done. So in the meantime, People who are, who are interested in one-on-one -on -one classes with me, uh, I would encourage you to, you know, shoot me an email and, um, you know, if we can get our schedules to fit together, I'm happy to do it. Okay, a question from Rich Ham. Uh, hey, love your YouTube channel, just getting started and finally getting decent bevels. My question is, do I sand out the grind lines on the bevels before or after heat treatment? The presumption here is that he's, I guess, going to be doing hand sanding uh, finish on the knives. So the short answer is you do not need to take out your initial grind lines before heat treatment. Now, I will say I personally like to get pretty close to my final grind lines um, and to move up to a little bit higher grit size. It's probably not that important, but um, if you're using like 36 grit belts, in theory, I mean not in theory, but in reality, you're creating these very deep little troughs that can create stress risers and uh, you know there's a fair amount of heart of uh, strain at the bases of these little 
V-shaped gullies that your abrasives are scraping out. Um, and it, you know, potentially can cause cracking um, that can undermine the, the integrity of your blade. So I do recommend to go up to a little bit higher grit size. Probably not crucial, but nevertheless worth doing. Then after you heat treat, do a little further grinding um, and go to even higher grit sizes. And then if you're hand sanding, hand sand at that point. Uh, so question from Bill Harrison here. Did you make the forge and burners you use to make the sushi knife? Also, how are you liking your Tormach CNC? And uh, do you think I could mill stainless steel CPM 154 for drop point hunter knives? So the, uh, the forge that I still have in my shop, I built over 20 years ago. And when I built it, I didn't have well, I didn't really have any tools at all. I had a hand drill, and uh, I guess I must have gotten a welder somewhere in there. But um, actually, maybe, no, the welder was actually well after uh, I made the forge. So the whole thing's screwed together, and it's made out of Schedule 40 pipe, so it's this enormously thick stuff. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but because it's so completely overbuilt, still works great and I just knock out the lining every year or so and reline it, and then I got a brand new forge again. It is the ugliest thing you could possibly imagine. All the burners were made in a ridiculous sort of way. In fact, they're not welded either. I remember now, I, um, I, I had to braze them together because I didn't have any welding equipment at the time. So, unbelievably crude, crude machine but I wanted a long forge that I could use for uh, making swords, and it still does the trick. So uh, I forgot to answer the question about the Tormach. So yeah, I use the Tormach all the time. It works great. CNC is so valuable to me. I may be getting something like a Haas, but uh, that's not a done deal yet. Bottom line is that the Tormach is a very capable machine and you know I use it to to make knives all the time it doesn't have any problem machining stainless steels like um, CPM 154 or ATS 34 so you know it, it has some limitations because it costs about a third the price of a low-end Haas but still it's a really great machine especially if you're just getting started with CNC and very capable and you can do all kinds of stuff as a knife maker with it all right, guys, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. So that means I got knives ready to come out of the heat treating oven. All right, see you guys soon. <laughs> thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years. So I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com